as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the Lord. And he said, Now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. You could rise early and go on your way. I see in verse 1 that Lot is sitting in the gate of Sodom. When I read that, my mind reflects back to a study we were engaged in almost two years ago, the book of Psalms, Psalm 1 and verse 1. How happy is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. The people and the citizens of Sodom scoff at the person and the principles of God. And so consequently, Lot was not happy in the words of Psalm 1.1. Lot has traveled up the down staircase, and his ascent, which was actually a descent, began back in chapter 13. So let's flip our pages back in your Bible to just refresh your memory of how Lot got to this place. Back to Genesis 13. And hopefully you have underlined in your Bible, Genesis 13, the words of verse 10, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan. It was well watered everywhere before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And then verse 11, I have underlined, Lot chose for himself those cities. Turn over one page to chapter 14. Chapter 14 in verse 12. They also took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions and departed for why he was living in Sodom. So Lot chose Sodom. Lot was living in Sodom. And that what happens in chapter 19. He is sitting in Sodom. He is sitting in the gate. The gate is where the hot shot sat. The gate is where business was transacted. The, the gate is where judicial decisions were determined. At first, he moved his tents as far as Sodom, making himself a frequent visitor to that town. And then he ends up in the city feeling comfortable there. And before you know it, he's in a position of political intrigue and power. He's in it up to his ears. One author writes, the world we live in today is much like the grassy area outside my kitchen door where I let my dog out to do her business every night. If you're not careful how you walk, you're going to step in it. Lot has stepped in it up to his ears, and believe me, this city stinks. We're going to see today and next Sunday a very important lesson from the life of Lot, and that is the lesson of how spiritual slippage occurs. It never occurs instantly. It always occurs gradually. It occurs almost imperceptibly. The best picture of spiritual slippage is cancer. Cancer does not kill an individual right off the bat. It takes a while before the effects begin to seep the life out of an individual. In Australia, a doctor told Billy Graham of a conversation he knew of that occurred between a man and his barber. As the scissors began to work, the barber said, hmm, you have a sore on your upper lip. Yes, he said, my cigarettes have done that. Doesn't seem to be healing. He said, oh, it will. I'm confident. A month later, he came back, and the, the cut was now split and ugly. It didn't look very good at all. He said, don't worry about it. I know it doesn't look good, but I'm using a cigarette holder. It's going to be just fine. And so the doctor gave the man some pictures of what lip cancer looked like and urged him to compare those pictures to his own lip in the mirror. He said, I'm not worried about it. Everything will be just fine. A month later, when he usually came in, he did not arrive. And so the barber asked a friend of his whereabouts. He said, didn't you hear? Sam died of cancer two days ago. It's exactly how it is with spiritual slippage. People I've known in churches over the years I've pastored. I see these little signs. 
First they're in a Bible study. They're committed and they're, they're in a church. And then they start slipping away from the Bible study. And then they attend church not every Sunday, but maybe twice a month. And then it's once a month. And then it's once every three months. And then they've let go of Christian friends. And all of a sudden, I just see them in the words of Paul Simon, slip sliding away. You could see it in Lot. And you could see it in too many believers today. That's what breaks my heart. What breaks my heart more than anything else is when people slip away and leave the church. That kills me as a pastor. You could come to me and tell me you have committed three of the worst sins known to man. That doesn't disturb me at all. I'll pray with you. I will minister you. I will care for you. But when people slip away from the Lord and slip away from the church, there is nothing I could do, and it breaks God's heart, and it breaks any good pastor's heart. And we have to be aware it's going to happen more and more because the Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the final sign that Christ is going to come back for us in the rapture, the final sign is the great falling away from the church. The great falling away. Look at that in the opening verses of chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians. Lot was slipping away from God. He slipped away from, uh, from Abraham and slipped away from all that is right. And he gave a little and he lost a lot. He's sitting in the gate of Sodom, verse 1. They rose to meet him. He bowed down with his face to the ground. In verse 2, Behold, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house. Spend the night. Wash your feet. They said, No, we will spend the night in the square. Verse 3, He urged them strongly to come in. Now, these are the same angels we met in chapter 18. The same ones who approached Abraham approached Lot. But there's a contrast between these two chapters. In chapter 18, when they come to Abraham, he's living in a tent because he's a pilgrim. But when they come to Lot, he's in a house, he's a citizen. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 10, Abraham had eyes for the celestial city. His eyes were on heaven. But we learn in chapter 13 and verse 10 of Genesis that Lot only had eyes for Sodom. When the angels came to Abraham, they were welcome. They said, sure, give us your food. We will enjoy your presence. We have read here in the text, when they came to Lot, they were curt. They did not want fellowship. Radically different pictures. Eastern hospitality. Lots of member of the city council. There's no one who knows Sodom better than Lot. He knows the bands of people that prowl the streets at night looking to do some damage. New minister moved to a new town, and it was late at night when his wife realized that uh, their dog, aptly named Trouble, <laughs> had not yet been taken out. And so she thought, you know, it's late. I just put on my bathrobe and go outside and, and let him go in the front yard for a second. But as you might expect, trouble got loose and he broke free. And so he took off down the street. And here's the pastor's wife at 11 o'clock at night in her bathrobe running down the street. The policeman pulls up, said, can I be of assistance? She said, oh, no, I'm just out here looking for trouble. <laughs> These deranged dopes were looking for trouble, and they found it. And that's the second point in your outline. We call it the attempted molestation, verses 4 to 5. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. They called to Lot and said, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we might have sexual relations with them. 
Now, if you're familiar with the uh, sordid story, you know these punks didn't quite pull off the prank, but I would say they gave it their ghetto best. The angels were forced to face off with degenerates at the door. We've had enough fun with the fellas of this town. We're itching for fresh flesh, and we're itching real bad. John Phillips puts it this way, every filthy dog of Sodom had come, young pups and old alike, panting, baying, growling, worse than dogs, worse than pigs, all heated up to the point of riot within their dreadful, hellish passions that were on fire. Verses 6 to 8. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind. And here's what Lot said. Listen to Lot's words, please. Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with man. Please let me bring them out to you. Do to them whatever you like. Only do nothing to these men inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. I, I am shocked when I read those words. I am chagrined. I am blown away at this man who is a believer, according to 2 Peter chapter 2, but gives no indications that he knows the Lord. How low could even a pagan father sink to say, take my own daughters and rape them? Do whatever you want to these ladies, my flesh and blood. Just don't touch my visitors. My, how low he has sunk. That's what happens when you start to slip away from God. That's what happens when you pull away from his people and you pull away from the ministries that God is involved in. Before you know it, you're acting worse than the unbelievers of the world. Lot's not even thinking. He's just driven by emotion. Verse 9, notice their response. Stand aside. Furthermore, they said, this one came and is an alien, and already he's acting as a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. And this brings out a very important principle. Say it with me. Compromising believers lose their credibility. You want to guarantee you'll have no impact upon your children, upon family members, upon friends, upon enemies. All you have to do is compromise in your faith. It'll kill you. It'll kill your impact. As a believer, Lot had no business living in those sin six cities. Here's another way to put it. If you claim to love the Lord one day a week, and then live like the world the rest of the week, your witness will be weak. You have nothing to say. And then when you try to speak, people will laugh at your words and your principles and your love for God. You'll be ineffective. I guess we could say Lot was a square peg in a round hole. He just didn't fit. He didn't fit anywhere. He didn't feel comfortable with Uncle Abraham and in a tent in Genesis 13. And you could see he's not at comfort with Sodom in Genesis 19. You know what that tells me? The most miserable person on planet Earth is not the unsaved individual. That guy or gal thinks they, they've uh, lured themselves into thinking that life is okay. Now, the most miserable person on the planet is the person who's a Christian and is not walking with God. That person is just gone. This is why Jesus calls us to full discipleship, to full commitment, to follow him completely, because he knows halfway is miserable. And the person who plays games with God is not because they feel comfortable listening to Pastor Rick's sermons on Sunday morning. But at the same time, they don't feel comfortable hanging around unbelievers on Saturday night. They can't find comfort anywhere. You might say that Lot was like a, a small pig moving through a boa constrictor. Initially, 
he seemed to change his circumstances and surroundings. But eventually, like everything else, he was absorbed. Take a look at verse 9b. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. I, I have those words, pressed hard, underlined. They remind us of what Jesus said last week when he spoke to Abraham about Sodom. Turn back one page, at least in my Bible, to Genesis 18, 20. The Lord said to Abraham, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great. Their sin is, note that, not grave, it's exceedingly grave. Exceedingly is a Hebrew word me'od, which means excessive, severe, or even violent. These are violent people. Paul described this unbated, perverted passion in chapter 1 of Romans, let's read it together. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For the women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. We read in the slip just before that, they burned with a passion. The word burned in the Greek is ekkaiao. Kaiao is to burn, but what does a preposition do to a Greek verb? It intensifies it. And it's the word ek from which we get exit. It's to burn out. It was to burn out with lust. In a documentary film on AIDS entitled Longtime Companions, one homosexual man is nursing his lover on his deathbed. And the interviewer asks him, what do you think happens when we die? And the man said, we get to have sex again. It's a burning passion that never ends. That's the way Paul pictures it. Look at verses 10 to 11 of Genesis 19. But the men reached out their hands and they brought Lot into the house with them and they shut the door and they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. Normal people would have backed off, but they're burning with such a passion that cannot be abated that they won't let go. And so finally, the angels had to do to them what the prophet Elisha had done to the Aramanian soldiers back in 2 Kings 6.18. They were temporarily struck with momentary blindness. They could not see. This was the judgment of God. And in their sexual desperation, they wore themselves out trying to worm their way in. There's a question for you. It's a question I had to ask myself this week. Did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of homosexuality. You're right. It was much more than that. I've been a pastor for 40 years. I've known in my lifetime a number of gay men and women. Outside the church who are not changing their behavior, and those in every church I have pastored who by the grace of God are doing their best to remain celibate and pure. And I applaud them for that. And all the homosexuals I have known in 63 years of living, I have never met an individual who has acted like this. I've never met a person who was so out of control that they were willing to bust down a door just to have that sexual drive met. There is a growing gay community today. And they're the ones that God calls us to reach out to. 
And we must be very careful about the words that we speak as Christians, even within the church. Because if we mock, if we make fun, if we call them sodomites, if we call them perverts, we ensure, number one, that if they're in the church listening to us, they will never come back. And number two, if they're outside the church and they hear us, they will never come to Christ. We have seen from the scripture we've read that we cannot biblically applaud their behavior. We had a straight couple leave our church not long ago because they know I don't applaud the behavior. And they left in anger and fury with curse words in their mouth. And that's okay. It breaks my heart, but that's okay because I could never applaud the behavior. But I always loved the person. And many Christians have a tough time loving people who aren't exactly like them. But God calls us to do that. Ed Dobson's a great illustration of making that happen. Ed graduated from Bob Jones University, and you can't get any more conservative than Bob Jones. Ed was Jerry Falwell's right-hand man. That takes him up the next ladder of conservatism. And then Ed Dobson was the founder of the Fundamentalist Journal. That makes him way out there. That's as far right as you can get on the spiritual lineage of being conservative. But Ed Dobson left Falwell's organization, and he moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan to begin a pastorate. And while there, he was concerned with the growing problem of AIDS in the city of Grand Rapids. And God laid on him to begin to build a bridge to those of the homosexual community. And he volunteered the services and the members of his church to reach out and to care for those who were sick and dying with AIDS. Now, initially, the gay activists were very leery. They knew this man was very popular in the fundamentalist circles, and they would not make that walk across the bridge. But because of his love and compassion, he drew them in. And there were those in the church who were angry and left the church and upset because they'd never met a homosexual and had no desire to reach out. But over the course of time, the two groups began seeing each other in a new way. One homosexual man said to Ed Dobson, we understand where you stand on our activity. We know you do not agree with what we're doing, but you show us the love of Jesus, and we're drawn to that. And so to many AIDS patients in Grand Rapids, the word Christian carries a different connotation than it did years ago. It shows that Christians could have firm views on ethical behavior and still be passionate in their love with people with whom they disagree. This is true for the homosexual. This is true for the person whom you disagree with very strongly politically. I have friends and neighbors who are radically different than I am when it comes to my politics. And when we get together, we could love on each other without having to push our views on each other. Because all that ultimately should concern us is whether or not they have come to the cross. Whether or not they know the Christ of the cross. And Ed Dobson said, if I die and someone stands up at my funeral and says nothing but Ed Dobson loved homosexuals, I will die a proud man. I had the privilege years ago of praying for and singing to a man in a hospice who was dying of AIDS. He had entered the gay lifestyle, and two months before his death, he'd come back to Christ. In the past, he was married. He had two sons. He was an Assemblies of God pastor. We don't know the stories of the lives of those we choose to condemn. So even though I will preach passionately when it comes to the word of God and the perversion that was there, I will also preach passionately about the love we're to have towards those who are outside our way of looking at things. We must hold the balance that Jesus always held. He was full of grace and full of truth. Amen. Don't err on either one of those. It's a tenuous tightrope walk. 
We have compassion for the person without congratulating the practice. Say that with me. We have compassion for the person without congratulating the practice, for the Bible says it's a sin, and it lists it with other sins. Let's read that in 1 Corinthians 6. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Now, here's the list. It's not an all-inclusive list. It's kind of a sample list of unrighteous deeds. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Chuck Swindoll would always say, be careful how you uh, pronounce that word swindlers. <laughs> So obviously homosexuality is not singled out as some special sin, as the worst of sins, but it is a sin, Paul says, that does carry with it unique consequences. For in the passage we read not long ago from Romans 127, he said they receive in their persons the due penalty of their error. You say, what does that mean? Well, The Health Risks of Gay Sex is a book authored by Dr. John Diggs, Jr., showing that homosexual behavior resulted in shortened lifespans with venereal diseases, including AIDS, and could lead to mental health problems. Dr. Riggs points out to a study in Canada of homosexuals that revealed that homosexuals and bisexuals have lost up to 20 years of life expectancy as compared to non-homosexuals. The probability of a 20-year-old gay male living to age 65 was only 32% as compared to those of 78% of men in general. Riggs also showed that high rates of infidelity and brief relationships occur in this community. In one study, only 15% of gay men and 17% of gay females had relationships that would last for three years. This is part of that due penalty that he speaks of. Across southern Africa today, the AIDS epidemic has left more than 13 million children without father and mother. And every day, 8,000 people in sub-Sahara Africa die of AIDS, while another 14,000 contract the HIV virus for the first time. Augustine was one of the framers of the church's theology. He was a great man of faith. But before he came to Christ, he lived a very promiscuous lifestyle. And Augustine made this statement. The soul lives by avoiding what it dies by desiring. These men were spiritually dead in less than a day. For us, it'll be seven days to next Sunday. They'll be physically dead. That's the attempted molestation. And it leads to our third thought today, the hesitation. We'll begin examining this point this morning and finish it off next week. First, we see the hesitation by the sons-in-law, verses 12 to 14. The two men said to Lot, who else do you have here, a son-in-law and your sons and your daughters and whoever you have in this city? Bring them out of this place. We are about to destroy this place because their outcry has become so great before the Lord, the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Lot went out. He spoke to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters and said, Up! Get out of this place! <coughs> The Lord would destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting. They thought he was telling a joke. Hey, that's a good one, Lot. By the way, who is the Lord? Yeah. See, Lot's witness as a believer was worthless. He'd given it up. And so now when he's forced to speak, now when he's impelled to speak of the coming judgment of God and he opens his mouth, he is laughed at. They don't want to respond to his words. 
The citizens of the city won't listen to him in verse 9. His members of his own family laugh at him. That's what happens when our sanctification's on the skids. We lose our impact with the rest of the world due to the decision to walk purposely away from Christ. Added to this tragedy, verse 12 indicates Lot had two sons, and nowhere does the text tell us that he ever went to talk to them about the judgment of God, not his own sons. He knew they were so far gone in sodomite wickedness that the words he spoke would fall on deaf ears. That's how bad it was. We'll see next Sunday that he escaped with his life, but Lot lost a lot. A few years ago in the city of St. Louis, an unemployed cleaning lady noticed that there was a few bees buzzing in and out of the vent that led to her attic. And she didn't pay much attention to it because there were only a few bees. Over the course of time, as the summer began to occur, more and more bees began moving in through that vent and filling the attic. She was unaware of the growing city of bees living directly above her head. It got so bad without her knowledge that the whole attic became a hive. And the second story caved in on the first story of her house due to the pressure of hundreds and hundreds of pounds of honey and thousands of angry bees. Somehow she escaped with her life, but she could not repair the damage of her accumulated neglect. It's a perfect picture of Lot. He will escape with his life, but basically nothing else. You know why? Because he just waited too long to deal with the parent disaster. It's possible today that there is a sin that you're engaged in in your life, and the Spirit of God has been speaking to you about that activity, and you keep playing games with it. It will lead to your disaster if you don't deal with it firmly and drastically. It could be an addiction. It could be a problem with gossip. It could be a look for lust. It could be any number of things. I don't know what it is. It's not my business. I'm not your Holy Spirit. But there is a Holy Spirit who lives in you, and he speaks to your heart, and he speaks to mine. And we will suffer the damages of our accumulated neglect if we continue down the path that leads away from God. You wait too long, and it's too late. There was an old European monastery that was perched high on a 500-foot cliff. Visitors would ride to the top of that monastery in a huge basket pulled to the top with a ragged old rope. One of the visitors, as they were going up, nervously asked the monk in charge, "Um, when do you guys replace the rope? He said, whenever the old one breaks. Hello, that's a little bit too late. And there are probably people that you know, and there are people that I know, who are Christians. But they've waited too late to repair the spiritual damage of their life. It's just too late. You know, God told uh, Abraham last week, if you could find 10 righteous people in that town, there were eight relatives, if you could get two friends and eight relatives saved and walking with me, I will spare the entire town. That's the grace of God for the sake of 10. But Lot couldn't find 10 to follow him. That's a good question. Do you have 10 people today who are following you in Christ? Could you count 10 individuals at a place you're employed, 10 relatives, 10 people that live in your neighborhood who respect your passion for Christ and would listen to you, even if they're not saved, they would listen to you and respect you because you walk with God? Are there at least 10 in your life today? That's the question I want you to ask yourself as you walk out today. Lot could not find 10. And then when he tried to speak to 10, it was too late because their hearts were too hard. 
You'd have to be blind, deaf, and dumb to think the Christ is not coming soon. You have to be completely removed from the internet and from Newsweek and Time Magazine and everything that's on the television and everything that's in the newspapers because everything in the world today is screaming towards the second coming of Christ. He could occur at any moment in time. And the first event on the eschatological character, the Bible calls the rapture. It's when his children are suddenly swept up to heaven. And when that occurs, the next event is the judgment of God upon unbelievers on this planet. And life here will be hell on earth. Jesus tells us that. As he spoke these words, listen how he ties it in with our passage today in Luke 17, 28. In the days of Lot, he writes, he speaks, they were eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, and building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, and God destroyed them all. Jesus said that's exactly how it will be at the appearance of the second coming of the Son of Man. For all those who were goofing around and not taking God seriously. The church goes up, and it will be a frightening, fateful wake-up call. And frankly, I don't wish that upon my worst enemy. The reason he hasn't come back yet, because 2 Peter 3, 9, God's not willing that any should perish. But he wants all to come to repentance. Some of you know Jim and Debbie Gonzalez. They've been attending our church for a number of months. Debbie recently shared this uh, story. It's a true story with me. Listen to this. The Thomas family were friends of our family for years. Bo and Dot did missionary work with my parents, Brad and Laura Miller, in Mexico. Due to a job change, the Thomases had to leave California and move to Michigan. Dot took the kids and went on ahead. Bo packed up the last of their things in a U-Haul trailer and hitched their car behind the U-Haul, heading out for Michigan. Going down the freeway, Bo looks to his left, sees his car, which came unhitched, moving alongside him on the freeway. Slowing down, he heads for the next exit, going to come back and pick up the car, praying, Lord, don't let it hit anything. Bo got on the freeway, heading the opposite direction, got off at one exit prior to where he lost the car, turned around, got back on the freeway, headed in the right direction, and began looking. Just up ahead, miraculously, the car had slowed to a stop and looked like someone had pulled it over to the edge. Everything was perfect. Now, as Bo parked the U-Haul on the side of the road, he noticed a man had stopped his truck ahead and was standing behind Bo's car. He was shaking his head, and his whole body was shaking. And he was saying again and again, oh, no, oh, no, I missed it, I missed it. Bo said, what's wrong? And the man pointed to the bumper sticker in the back of the car, which read, in case of rapture, this car will be unoccupied. <laughs> and she writes, right there on the side of the road, Bo led that truck driver to Christ. Let's bow together. Homework assignment for every member of Orange Coast Community Church for the year 2016. Every one of us have friends, relatives, close family members, people we work with, people we chum with that will not go up in the rapture if it occurs today. I'd like you to take a three by five card, post-it sticker, whatever you choose, list the names of several of those people and put them in a spot where you will see them every day throughout this year. And you would pray ardently and passionately before God. Lord, 
use me to bring them to you and to bring them to Orange Coast Community Church this year. It's possible that you're present today, but you never made a personal decision to embrace the God of grace and the gift he gave you at a place called Calvary. Judgment is coming. God does not want you to be a recipient of that form of firm righteousness. He wants you safe in his family. He wants you with the church in heaven, away from the hell on earth that this place and this planet will experience. But you have to make a choice. You have to decide to give your life and your heart to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, you've decided That's what I want. And so if that's your heart's prayer and your life's desire, and at this specific moment in time, I want you to raise your head and look at me in the eyes, saying, today, for the first time, Pastor, I give my life to Christ. You could do that right Father, this was a, uh, a hard passage to preach. It, uh, it speaks to the reality of what's coming down the pike. We thank you as Christians in this place today that Romans 8, 1 says, we will never be condemned by you. We'll be safe in the loving arms of Jesus. But we all have friends and relatives who don't know you. I thank you for the two who raised their heads as Christians to say, I'm their pastor. I'm rededicating my heart to you. You bless them for that rededication and those hearts that are given to you. We're going to have a great time today at Super Bowl. We're going to have a lot of fun. And, but Lord, let us not, not forget what we've heard today. And let us be passionate about our prayers for those outside the faith today. This is my prayer for myself and your people. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.